True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. You know, sometimes a small thing in life can really change everything. That's what happened when high school student Susan May Bowling was sent to a psychotherapist for treatment of her depression and anxiety. Her therapist, Dr. Felix Polk, was married with two children, but that didn't stop him from beginning a sexual relationship with Susan. Susan and Felix Polk ended up getting married in 1982, shortly after he had divorced his wife. Despite the huge 26-year age difference, they seemed pretty happy. But with several years of marriage and raising their three sons together, the couple had a contentious relationship. This resulted in more than one call to the police with allegations of domestic violence. Join us at the quiet end for May-December murder. When Dr. Felix Polk was found dead at age 70, their youngest son Gabriel blamed his mother Susan. Their oldest son Adam called Susan Cuckoo, and Susan herself just seemed unfazed by her husband's death, leading investigators to contend that she had planned his murder, and her motive was money. So Dick, I think you're going to enjoy this discussion We've talked about this case a little bit in preparation, and it is just, for lack of a better word, crazy. It is bizarre, that's for sure. So we got a California beer to drink today, and I chose one called Born Yesterday from Lagunitas Brewing Company. It's an American pale ale, 7.2% ABV. Nice beer. Hazy orange color, pretty full white head, a little bit of sticky lace, nice aroma, Citrus fruit, tropical fruit, and very good taste. Got some orange, some lemon, and a little bit of melon. There's a little bitterness late in the taste, but overall this is a pretty nice, smooth, easy drinking beer. So we'll go share some with our friends. All right, let's open it up. All right, come on down here. It's been chilly outside, so let's sit next to the fireplace and get cozy before we begin our talk. I think we need to. All right, Dickie, why don't you go ahead and start this story off? I have a lot to talk about here. A lot of opinions, I have to admit. Okay, opinion girl. So Susan was the second child of Helen and Richard Bowling. Pregnancy was unplanned, and Helen uh, had a bit of postpartum depression following Susan's birth. Susan was a really cute baby, but a definite handful. She was walking by eight months of age, and before entering kindergarten, she was reading at a second grade level. And despite Helen's difficulties with the depression, she was a good mother. She went to the library often. She'd bring home books for her children to read. She liked to read them stories from the great Russian authors. And she socialized her family with other families who were also well-read. Now, you might think that the themes in some of these books were not necessarily age-appropriate for Susan, and you'd be right. (laughs) Some of Helen's favorites included War and Peace and The Idiot, which are very pleasant stories of betrayal and murder. They are damn good books, though. They are. I'm just not sure. uh, Maybe not for a kindergartner. Five or six-year-old. Yeah, that's a little crazy. So, and Dad, Richard Bolling, he worked and he went to law school in the family's early years. So he wasn't around too much with his kids. The plan was that he would make up for the lost time after he graduated. But instead of making up for lost time, he decided to divorce Helen because he'd found a new woman. So Susan was five years old when her parents divorced. And Helen told Susan that her father suffered from penisitis. (laughs) I like that. And all men think with their penises. Well, of course we do. Now, after Richard remarried, he tried to get custody of his kids. And Helen, whose own mother had lost custody of her children and had been devastated by that, Helen was terrified of losing custody. 
and she actually did have a, a nervous breakdown and needed to be hospitalized. In the end, though, she did maintain custody of the kids. Yeah, that must have been a big relief for her. Helen had had a difficult childhood, and she had actually dropped out of school. So, of course, she wanted her children to have better lives than she had had. She taught Susan that education was really the only way to lift herself out of poverty and enter the middle class. Money was in really short supply, and Susan, her brother David, and Helen all moved into a small apartment in Oakland. And Susan shared a bedroom with her mother, and David slept on the sofa. So they're really having to tighten their belts. I guess. As David and Susan got older, their father just totally lost interest in them. So by her teens, Susan rarely saw him. And Helen was smart enough to know that this was a problem. She was worried. She wrote a letter to him begging him to give his children some of his attention. But still, he was just totally into his new wife, his new family, and never really made much of an effort. As Susan got older, she was showing very little interest in socializing with other children. And by high school, she just really disliked other teens and began skipping classes. She was an avid reader with her own ideas, and she saw the social world of the school as just being beneath her. She ended up falling behind in her classes, just choosing to kind of isolate and live in the world of her books. So I have this picture of her just kind of sitting by herself reading a book and not socializing with anybody. You know, that's kind of me in the 11th grade. <laughs> so I can kind of relate to that. <laughs> but when the school recommended that Susan be seen by a psychotherapist, Helen was fully on board with that. And she drove Susan to Berkeley for her first appointment with Dr. Felix Polk, a really respected therapist. Felix's office was in a house that had been converted to offices down on Ashby Avenue, and when he met them in the waiting area and then walked them into his office, Helen felt encouraged. He seemed like a really kind, calming man who exuded authority and respect. Helen stayed with Susan through the first session, and they agreed that it had gone really well. So when Susan agreed to see him again, Helen was relieved. She felt sure that Susan would hate him and not want to come back because that was her normal thing. But she felt confident that this Dr. Polk was really going to help her daughter get the things she needed to grow up a happy, reasonable adult. Yeah, and Susan really liked to talk with Felix about the books she was reading. But even though things seemed to be going well with her therapy, her life didn't show any real immediate improvement. She continued to skip school, which Felix accepted, and actually supported her decision not to go. Then she was caught shoplifting a dress and was sentenced to a month in juvenile hall. She ran away from there, hitchhiked to a friend's house in Oakland where she hid out for a month. When she finally called her mother, Helen contacted Felix and he made arrangements with the courts for her to avoid juvenile hall if she went to continuation school and stayed in therapy with him. Yeah, but you know, Susan hated continuation school. The classes there were in the trades, and she saw herself as more of an intellectual. But she always looked forward to her therapy appointments with Felix Polk. And she loved being near the university. She began to really buy into the hippie culture, wearing mini skirts and no bra, and she let her thick, wavy, dark hair grow kind of wild past her shoulders. But for Susan, no one understood her like Felix did. He empathized with her depression, and he even shared personal stories from his own life. The physical relationship began when she was just 14, according to Susan, although there are varying stories about this, and Felix had told some people she was 18 or 19. Well, of course he would. <laughs> yeah, I know. So she certainly was too young. I mean, even if she was 18. Plus, she's his well, patient. she's a patient. Which is totally wrong, Yes. So this, you know, this girl already had issues, and I think he made them worse. Oh, absolutely. Now, one day Susan came home from an appointment, and she told her mother that her boyfriend was a doctor. So Helen was pretty upset when she learned Susan was talking about her therapist, Dr. Polk. She didn't go to the authorities, but she did go to speak with him. She thought that he was helping Susan, and she also felt certain that the affair would die out. 
And when she spoke to him, she asked him to be kind to Susan, let her down easy when things ended, and he promised her that he would. What is this, in the 70s? Yeah, it's in the free love era. Yeah, so I, I can kind of see some of that, but it's just... An underreaction, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Yeah, it wouldn't fly now. Not in the least. So let's talk a little bit about Felix, because he had a really interesting upbringing that kind of brought him to where he was. All of these people had some pretty big burdens to deal with through their life, mentally. Yes, they did. So Felix Polk was born in Austria in 1932. His family was Jewish. He was a fraternal twin with his brother John, and he had an older sister named Evelyn. His early childhood was pretty idyllic. He and his sibs had a child-sized train in their yard, and they vacationed in the mountains with their governesses. And in the winter, the family would go on skiing trips. They were pretty much Jewish in name only. They never went to temple, and they celebrated Christmas with a tree and cookies and gifts. Yeah, they lived in a beautiful stone house with a cook, a maid, a chauffeur, and governesses. So I think that means each child had their own governess. It sounds like that, right? Yeah. Felix's mother was absent a great deal of the time, so Felix really bonded much more with his nursemaid or governess, Katya. Katya was devoted to Felix, too, refusing an offer of marriage from the postman she was dating because she would not leave Felix behind. The family's wealth really dated back to Felix's maternal grandfather, who started out as a pushcart peddler of clothing. From there, he built a men's clothing store where he sold jackets and custom suits. Once Felix's father married his mother, then he began working in the store. So the family, pretty much all of them, worked six days a week and really did a good job because they ended up opening a second store, which was just as successful as the first one. And obviously they did well financially. They were living a good life for a time. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly life changed for the Polks in 1938. Felix and his brother were just six years old when the Nazis arrested their father. He was released only after he handed over his business and his home to the Nazis and agreed to leave Austria. So then the family had to find a country that would be willing to take them in. As they're waiting for visas that they hoped would arrive any day, the Nazis began to raid their street. So to avoid being arrested, the family would hide in plain sight each day, six in the morning to noon, at a nearby park. And then when they were gone, Nazis searched the streets for Jews. So this is terrifying, and I can't even imagine it. And also, I think, what about the people who are less fortunate and don't have the money or the resources? Well, we know what happened to we, them. We know what happened. We do. But just horrific, of course. And you have to wonder how that affects a small child. It can't be good. No. It has it, to be so traumatic. I can't comprehend going day to day worrying that somebody's going to kill you or kill your parents or something. I know, right? Horrible. Horrible. It's really horrible. And if they couldn't have got these French visas, they probably would have all been killed. When they left Vienna, Felix was separated from his nursemaid, Katya, and he last saw her at a train before his family pulled away. And for the rest of his life, Felix would remember that day and his feelings of anger and doom, and he would share that story with a lot of people. It was certainly life-changing for him. Once the family was in Paris, he and his siblings were sent away to boarding school. So there, he's away from his family and Katya, and he had nightmares and just had a horrible time. Also, the staff at his boarding school didn't speak German, which is what he spoke, so there was no one to talk to him or even understand what he was going through. So my heart breaks for this young Felix. Certainly wasn't easy. I can't even imagine. And then it, it kind of gets worse because Paris became unsafe for them. So they ended up moving from Paris to a city called St. Malo, where they found a family who took them in. Felix's father joined the French army, and the children went to public school. The villagers covered for them. You know, when Nazis arrived, and they convinced the soldiers that the family was from Alsace-Lorraine. Well, Felix certainly remembered this time differently than his siblings did. 
He called the living conditions desperate and restrictive. When it got dark in the evenings, the children were told to stop talking and be still, and he would refer to this as the Anne Frank existence. While their father was at war, they certainly didn't have a lot, and there were times where they just lived off root vegetables and some scraps of horse meat. There were also times when the children were sent out to the nuns to beg for milk. So the family was reunited when Felix's mom ran a newspaper ad in southern France. Another Viennese refugee saw the ad and gave it to Felix's father when he saw him near the Spanish border. And then they returned to Paris. To keep what money they had left from being confiscated, they baked it into loaves of bread. They applied for U.S. visas, and they waited for those to come through in an old farmhouse. Then they made their way to Portugal before they were able to immigrate to the United States. Now, Felix felt safe in the U.S., and food was plentiful, so that was a big thing. The family never looked back, though. They never talked about it, according to Felix. It was seldom even mentioned. They started their lives over in New York, but Felix was angry because now they had a much lower socioeconomic status. Huh. Very much lower. Yes. But all three of the kids worked hard and excelled in school. Felix was shy and spent most of his time reading. He received a scholarship to St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. A fairly rigorous school. Now, Felix was quiet and a loner while he attended college. He rarely dated, but was a philosopher. He would analyze himself and the culture he lived in. Now, after he graduated from college, he joined the Navy, and he attended Officer's Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island. And by this time, he was pretty withdrawn and depressed and suffering from anxiety. He ended up being stationed in Japan, where he served aboard a ship as store officer and gunnery officer. Then when he got home on leave, he went to see a psychiatrist. He was pathologically self-conscious, even to the point of being unable to hold a conversation with a date. Yeah, he did have one girlfriend during this time. It was an older woman, an actress named Winnie. And he told her that he had thought about killing himself. And then he was really interested and asked a lot of questions about her brother, who had committed suicide. But she didn't take him seriously for whatever reason. One evening, after going to a matinee with Winnie, Felix was just inconsolable. He went back to his parents' home alone, and he called Winnie at 7 p.m. to let her know he'd gotten home safely. But he sounded so miserable that she was very concerned. She called him back a couple hours later, but couldn't pull him out of his darkened mood. And it was near midnight when she decided she was going to call the police to check on him. So the police did go out there, and they found Felix unconscious in the garage, which was filled with carbon monoxide from the car's exhaust. And this had absolutely been a serious attempt on his own life. If the police hadn't come, he definitely would have been dead. Oh, no question. Only reason was his actress girlfriend who called the police. Otherwise, he'd be there until morning. Yep. Well, naval doctors diagnosed Felix as suffering from a schizophrenic reaction. He was hospitalized for a year. His sister spoke to doctors and tried to get him released, but his brother and parents never spoke to him about the attempt at all. They just acted like nothing had happened. And that's kind of how that family operated. And I think that's what led to Felix being so interested in psychology and relationships. The subject just wasn't talked about, and that was a lot like their experiences during the war. Nobody mentioned it. Felix seemed to make a remarkable turnaround while he was in the hospital. After his release, his brother's wife set him up with Sharon, who was an accomplished pianist at Juilliard. After he was officially discharged from the Navy, Felix married Sharon, and he went on to get his master's degree in social work, and this was in 1959. Yeah, then in 1960, Felix and Sharon moved to California so he could attend grad school at Berkeley and get a Ph.D. in psychology. Felix, for his part, wanted a fresh start away from the East Coast, but at, at first he didn't fit in to the Berkeley counterculture. Felix was a family man and a serious student who retired from the military, but that would gradually change and he eventually became part of the counterculture. He joined in the movement against the Vietnam War, 
and he experimented with free love. Yes, yeah, so despite his insecurities, Felix became a well-known member of the psychotherapeutic community, and he began doing lectures at the University of California at Berkeley. In 1971, Felix began treating Susan Bowling. At 39 years old, Felix was a confident and respected professional, and he seemed to offer a lot of warmth, and he inspired a lot of trust. He managed a program for drug-abusing adolescents in the Berkeley schools, and he was the chief psychologist for mental health services of Almeda County. He was in charge of psychological services for the county's clinics and hospitals as well. He trained probation officers, and he developed his own classifications to interpret specific psychological tests. So his patients really trusted him, and also his peers respected him. His home life really appeared to be ideal with Sharon. Everyone thought that they were just an ideal couple, and they appeared to be very much in love as they raised their two young children together. In the early 70s, liberal West Coast therapists would socialize with their patients. And Felix saw no harm in doing this, and he had no problem whatsoever sharing his own deepest secrets with his patients. He believed it was a way to develop trust. But he didn't have any real boundaries in this. No, apparently not. Well, no. Look what he did. He became involved with Susan as a teenager. Definitely crossed a line there. But Susan believed that she and Felix shared a unique way of seeing the world. Felix had to have known that his relationship with Susan was dangerous, but somehow convinced himself that it could be managed. So he just allowed her to idolize him, which is quite normal with a patient and their therapist. And he encouraged her ideas of how they were alike and how she didn't need to go to school and all this stuff. But I don't think that was healthy for Susan. Instead of growing stronger and more independent, she became more focused on her role as Felix's lover and patient. She was arrested for shoplifting in 1974, and then she attempted suicide by swallowing a bunch of her mother's sleeping pills. Helen came home to red lipstick on a mirror, music playing at high volume, and her daughter unconscious on her bed. Helen took her to the hospital where they pumped her stomach and kept her on the psychiatric unit, but only really for a short time. Helen was really upset to see her daughter getting worse. She felt she had no choice but to consult Felix, who was her therapist after all. Well, yeah, but it's kind of, he's the reason why she's ended up where she is, so... Well, I don't think Helen saw it that way. Well, obviously not. No. And Felix took no responsibility, none whatsoever. He blamed others. He wrote a letter to the juvenile court. Now, the court did end up agreeing with him that Susan needed therapy more than she needed punishment. So she did not have to serve any more time for the shoplifting charge, and she would not be expected to go to school either. So she was released to the custody of her mother and her therapist. So this high school kid ends up never going to a prom, never going to a homecoming, but devotes her life to reading and to her therapy with Felix Polk. So probably not a good idea. As we'll see as she gets older, she has a lot of issues, and I don't think he really helped her out. We can talk about that, how therapy is supposed to help a person become more independent and make decisions for themselves, but he just allowed her to be dependent on him. And really, he became her world. And he probably enjoyed that. It probably gave him a real boost. Sure. So Felix began bringing Susan to his adolescent psychology classes and showing her off as a cured schizophrenic. He invited other professors to some of these classes, but they were really not happy and pretty skeptical of the word cure. The fact that he would even say he had cured her really showed how high his opinion of himself was. And it didn't seem to be the correct way to be thinking as a therapist. He's supposed to be helping her with coping mechanisms. Yes, he is. But everyone in these classes had to notice that Dr. Polk seemed all too familiar with his patient. One student described Dr. Polk's interview with Susan as too seductive, uncomfortable to watch. People in the class asked each other what was going on. And they said, well, these two are definitely lovers. Felix's mentor at the college told Felix he needed to stop it. But he didn't. The relationship continued as it had 
Actually, I think she got in even deeper. But one important aspect of this relationship, I think, was that Felix saw Susan as a victim, and she saw him as her rescuer. The more she needed him, the more of a god he was in her eyes. And he really fed into her admiration of him. He would tell her how special and beautiful she was. But like I said, he wasn't preparing her for life as an adult or to be independent. It's like he was just raising her to be who he wanted in his life for himself. So I really see it as a selfish thing, the way he dealt with this patient. What do you think? No question. And if Felix was trying to keep the affair a secret, he wasn't doing a very good job. He shared an office with a female psychiatrist, and she told her husband that Felix was, quote, fucking his patient, end of quote. (laughs) Now, at that point, Susan was 20 years old, so it wasn't statutory rape that they knew of or pedophilia, but it was definitely unethical. The psychiatrist had seen Felix and Susan together, and she often heard Felix whispering and flirting with Susan. Yeah, so imagine this. It had to be sickening to be a professional, and then you see one of your colleagues acting like this with a young girl. I mean, even if she's 20, it's gross. Even if she was his age, it would be definitely wrong. But he was acting like a schoolboy around her. So it was something that would really make you just want to throw up right there in your shoes. Yeah. For sure. And I know this at this point in the 70s, there, there wasn't any real prohibition on sleeping with a patient or having sex with a patient as there is now. But still, as you said, highly unethical. Oh, absolutely. So one day in 1978, when Susan was 21, Felix's wife Sharon barged into the office and confronted his colleagues. What kind of doctors are you? She yelled. How can you be decent people when one of your colleagues is fucking his patient? Then Felix came in from his office after Sharon left, very brave of him, and he apologized for her. But his female colleague said to him, You don't need to apologize for her. You need to apologize to everyone who you've exposed to this dreadful thing. So she was trying to hold him to task on it. But she was really the only one that was seriously trying to get him to shape up. I wonder if they reported him to the medical board or anything. Not that I know of. Yeah. Nothing seemed to happen to him as far as his license to practice. Yeah. Okay. Well, Helen was upset that her daughter was continuing to be with a married and much older man. She knew for sure that they were having sex by the time Susan was 18 and probably suspected Susan had been younger when they started it, but in any event, she knew they were sexually active when Susan was 18. At the time, it was not illegal for a therapist to have sex with a patient. In fact, the California Psychological Association didn't declare sex with a patient to be unethical until 1992. Today, the American Psychiatric Association prohibits sex between a doctor and patient or even a former patient, unless it has been more than two years since the last therapy session. It's a no-no. It's an absolute. Absolutely. The real issue is the intimacy more than the sex. And once an intimate relationship between therapist and patient ends, the patient can feel isolated, guilty, and unable to trust. There was a study of a 1,000 patients who had had sex with their therapists. 3% of these married their therapist, 11% were hospitalized for psychological problems, and 14% attempted suicide. Not good numbers. No, I think it's totally immoral and damaging. I actually had a woman friend, middle-aged, so not a young person, who ended up having an affair with her psychiatrist, and it really did a job on her, because that's the person she's supposed to be able to go to and talk about her problems in life, and he became this whole other entity in her life, which was negative. So I could certainly see how that would mess a person up because it takes a while to develop a certain relationship with a therapist. And then once that's breached like that, who knows what can happen? I know. It's just so wrong. Yeah, I suppose. uh, And even, even with that, I mean, if you're starting to have feelings for each other, then you need a different doctor. That's true. But almost every patient 
gets some transference and has some feelings for their therapist. And the therapist is supposed to deal with that in a certain way. Sure. Not return those feelings. But if you feel like you're going to return those feelings, you got to discharge the patient from your practice. Yeah, find them a different therapist, for, right. sh- for sure, yes. But he certainly didn't want to do that. It was really like he's taking advantage of her. Well, he probably had what uh, Susan's mother called penisitis. <laughs> yes, a severe case, I would guess. Yes. Jill, it looks to me like you've been wrapping up more gifts over the past month. Yeah, we've had a real uptick in subscribers to TCB Premium. I think it might be due to the added benefit of ad-free versions of all of our shows that we're offering now. So now Tie Grabbers get a bonus episode each month and a free gift of their choice, but they can even get weekly episodes without the ads. Yeah, they deserve it. Our listeners are kind, loyal, and they send us excellent comments and case suggestions, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. It's true. Our listeners are the best. No kidding. Thanks, Tie Grabbers. Yeah, and if you haven't subscribed to the premium show and you're interested, just drop by tiegrabber.com and check it out. See what you think. A great idea. So Susan did begin taking classes at Mills College in 1977, and she ended up leaving Felix that winter but they were back together within six months. Then Felix separated from his wife, Sharon, and they did go through a divorce. After that, Susan transferred to San Francisco State, and she and Felix moved in together. Some of Felix's colleagues stopped referring patients to him after that because they totally disagreed with this. But he was still very beloved by his students. In 1981, Felix entered the faculty room and he announced, The good news is I'm getting married. The bad news is is that I'm marrying a (laughs) 12-year-old. Great joke, Doc. So by this time, everyone already knew about Felix and Susan. They were living together. And of course, Helen wasn't thrilled to have Susan marrying him. But it wasn't really a shock. It was just awkward. And, you know, Felix was two years older than Helen, Susan's mother. So it must have been really awkward for Helen. (laughs) His his mother-in-law is younger than him. Yeah, yep. So the wedding day was the day after Christmas, 1981. At this point, Felix was 49 and Susan was 24. Felix's family saw Felix as being really happy with Susan, and they accepted her into the family. Helen was nice to everyone but she still felt really critical and skeptical about this marriage. She worried about it, how her daughter was going to do with this. Well, gee, where do I start? (laughs) I'd be with Helen. I figure that this union is doomed. So I'm a little surprised that it lasted as long as it did. Well, yeah, I think the longer it lasted, the more people started thinking, well, maybe it's just one of these unusual things that's going to work out. Yeah, possibly. But, you know, just this whole doctor-patient relationship is very worrisome. And then the age difference. I mean, this this is like marrying your father. Well, it brings me to mind of Mary Kay Letourneau, who is the teacher that started seeing her, I think he was only 12, her student. But that lasted a long time. They ended up getting married and were together for years. They did eventually break up, but... Once they were together and kind of had a family, people thought, well, it was wrong. She went to jail because he was so young. But the problem is they seem happy together. So maybe it was just meant to be. And that's kind of the attitude that people adopt after so much time. Yeah, well, that's the way you have to look at it, I guess. I guess, but I don't think Helen saw it that way at all. Yeah, I'm with Helen. Because Susan was just a kid you were going to worry about anyway lot going on with this woman. Fortunately, though, Helen had done really well after her divorce, and she had made a good deal of money investing in real estate. So she helped Susan and Felix buy a large house in Berkeley's Elmwood district. So they lived in a really nice neighborhood with professors, a couple of hippie communes, and a lot of politically active people. 
That very same year, Susan graduated college and she had a degree in creative writing. Felix moved out of his office into their house so he could be close to Susan, and he would see her during his lunch and his breaks. But he was quite busy. He worked 12-hour days, six days a week, so he was really in demand as a therapist. Boy, I guess that is a back-breaking work week. Yes. It's uh, 70 hours. Man, I guess his referrals hadn't totally dried up. No, no, not at all. I think his lecturing and teaching brought in a lot of people. Yeah. Unfortunately, he was pretty horrible at business. His bills were often not paid because he saw his patients as his friends, and he didn't remind them when they owed him money. Susan redecorated the house, then she brought some properties, improved them, and rented them out. So she's kind of following her mother's footsteps, becoming a, a developer type yes. of thing. Mm -hmm. Susan entertained herself for the most part by reading and writing in her journal. Yeah, then in January of 1983, Susan gave birth to their first son, Adam. She was a very devoted mom, keeping the baby with her as she went about her day. But, you know, Felix seemed jealous of the attention she showered on their son. So it's just interesting to me that this psychologist is so emotionally damaged. You know, he's, he has issues. Oh, he definitely does. But they do say that people that gravitate to that profession do have issues that they're trying to work out on their own, and that's why it interests them, which makes sense. Sure. So later that year, Susan became obsessed with the McMartin Preschool Abuse Scandal, which was in Manhattan Beach, California. So if you don't remember this, parents and children were accusing the caregivers at the McMartin Preschool of sexual, physical, and psychological torture as part of a satanic cult. And soon there were similar accusations at other daycare centers. So this became a big problem. Many stories were published about satanic abuse in daycare centers, and this fear just caught hold through a lot of communities. But the problem for Susan is that these stories absolutely fed into her paranoia. After Adam turned one year old, both Susan and Felix noticed what they thought were some bad signs. The child bit the family dog, and then he began to have nightmares. He was only with a babysitter occasionally, but Susan suspected that Adam, like the McMartin preschool children, had been a victim of satanic abuse. Now, this certainly sounds like uh, Susan's having some break with reality here. Although, yes. Although, I guess at the time, it might not have seemed that way. There was a lot of attention paid to this preschool. And, oh, absolutely. This was a big thing. For a long time. For a very long time. And it turned out not to be true at all. There's never any evidence of it. No. But this was just the kind of thing that she could really buy into and get carried away with because absolutely. she had such paranoia. Yeah. So she interviewed her child. We're talking about a one, one and a half year old. Felix's daughter from his first marriage saw these interviews and she was quite alarmed. Susan believed that Adam could give her verbal cues and even identify the people responsible for his abuse. He would just babble and Susan would look through the phone book to identify the name he was saying. And I hate to laugh, but this is just crazy ridiculous. <laughs> yes, it is. You can't make this up. And if she believed he'd identified someone and she found him in the phone book, she'd drive to their address and she would stalk them, truly believing that these people had abused her son. Yeah, and the more information Susan thought Adam was sharing with her, the, the more Felix was convinced that Adam had been abused. And he also started asking Adam questions. Both Susan and Felix decided that Adam was being taken away from the babysitter's house in a bus with other children and the kids were caged in a warehouse. And in the warehouse, adults performed satanic rituals and raped the children. Of course, the rapes were video recorded also. Yes, but none of those videotapes were ever found. But the thing about Felix here is he would never question Susan, and I think he must have known at some times that she was just off the rails. But he would validate whatever she said and go along with it. Yeah which wasn't doing her any favors. No, and he should have known that better than any of us, right? He's a professional. 
Well, her ideas progressed to include child murder. From Adam's answers to them, they decided that a baby had been put into a plastic bag and that children had been buried alive, burned, and drowned, so just horrific things. He supposedly told his parents that the group of Satanists were cannibals as well. And similar stories were believed by parents across the country, so it wasn't only them. And some therapists were really throwing fuel on the fire by going ahead and asking anxious children leading questions. And these children are trying to please their parents and the therapist, so they're making stuff up. Because when they say something, they get the attention, they get the positive feedback from their parents. So it's just a real mess. Yeah, and for years... Felix and Susan thought that the satanic abuse was pretty widespread. Now, they had a second son, Eli, in 1985, and a third son, Gabriel, in 1987. All through this time, they continued to interview Adam. They explained the lack of evidence, which there certainly was, Yes. by the fact that there was an extensive underground satanic conspiracy connected with the government. Well, and that's how these conspiracy theories work. Right? Well, look at QAnon. Exactly. It's the same kind of thing. So it's been going on for years. That's right. Susan and Felix founded an organization they called Enough! Exclamation mark. This was a group of angry parents who believed they were out to stop a secret society. They spoke at rallies, and they demanded that the government take action. Yeah, their concerns were sent to the Attorney General, who they criticized for failing to press charges against these groups of pedophiles, cannibals, and child killers. Felix told one of his patients that Adam had been taken in a van to a warehouse where he had witnessed children being killed. This patient, also a friend, was really concerned. He was concerned about Felix's mental health to be saying these things. But Felix was determined that bringing this issue to light would result in enough public outrage to create new laws to protect children. At least that's what he said. He had many admiring patients who believed he was a caring and skilled therapist. But at this point, many were beginning to worry that maybe he was becoming unhinged from reality. You think? Yeah. Yeah. His daughter from his first marriage even told him that she believed he was just going along with Susan just to be on her side. And as Adam got older, he believed that his father was just so in love with his mother that he couldn't accept that she was paranoid and delusional. So even as a young child, he's seeing it more clearly than his psychologist father. Instead of getting help for Susan, Felix had decided to join her in creating a public campaign to end satanic child abuse. And again, no evidence whatsoever of this. None. But Adam was a smart kid. By the time he was in first grade, he felt like he knew exactly what was going on. He never believed the stories, and he went through similar interviews with his mother for years. The poor kid. And what does that do to you? If both your parents are delusional, you know, you trust your parents when you're little. Yeah, you're six, seven years old. And your parents are telling you this awful stuff? Yeah, I know. Since he was one and a half. A baby, really. Mm -hmm. So when he wanted to stop seeing a therapist they were sending him to, Susan told him, well, if you've been molested by this therapist, you don't have to go back. So just to get out of going, he told her, yes, I've been molested by my therapist. So this resulted in his parents filing a police report against that therapist. And the therapist maintained his innocence and tried to do everything he could, but eventually just had to move out of the state because they were trying to destroy him. And Adam felt bad about that, but, you know, he was just a little boy. So you can't blame him. Pretty much doing what his parents told him to do. Yeah, and who knows what he was having to talk about at therapy, you know? It was probably awful. It probably was. Yeah. So according to Felix's mentor, Felix confessed to him in later years that he had never actually believed his or Susan's claims about satanic abuse. He said he had joined her as a marketing idea in an attempt to make himself a famous expert in the field. Well, that's just kind of sickening also. It is sickening. Victimizing his child, really. Yes. And all these people who he's trying to get to believe these things and all the children that he's getting involved in this. It's very abusive, very unethical. 
he's not that sympathetic because no. he's horrible in a lot of ways. But by the 1990s, this hysteria over satanic abuse was fading out, and there had never been one piece of compelling evidence. Susan and Felix's campaign fell off too, but Susan would maintain that the Satanists had threatened them to back off or else, so they had no choice. Well, yeah. They were being threatened. Not really. In, in their mind. Yes, in her mind. So although Susan did continue to worry about her children, the family lived a pretty normal, happy life for the rest of the 1990s. She and her sons went to the park and the library. They walked to the local bakery for bagels and pastries. As they got older, her sons played sports. The family took some nice trips to state parks and went on long hikes. So in many ways, they were living a normal life, eating dinner together each night at the same time, and taking some trips to Canada, Europe, and back east to New York. Susan was always there, but Felix really didn't spend a lot of time with his sons. He was a loving father, but didn't do much with them, and he was definitely more interested in Susan than his kids. And his whole project in life was to keep Susan happy and to keep her with him. And you'll see a lot of bad things happen because of that. But even after many years together, Susan and Felix seemed to still be very much in love. They showed physical affection regularly. And Felix always liked to go shopping with Susan. They'd write poems to one another. And Felix believed that his wife was brilliant. I think she probably was brilliant, but she was also mentally ill and needed help she wasn't getting. Right. Yes, yes. Very much so. Right. So while he could seem overbearing, there really was no doubt that he loved spending time with Susan, but he just wasn't doing the right things to help her. The Polks moved to a bigger, more stately home in Piedmont in 1992, and Susan did extensive remodeling, and they also built a library where she just loved to spend hours reading. Felix also kept his office in the house, saving money and staying close to her. So I often wonder, as I was reading about this, was he jealous? Was he afraid to have her on her own because she was so much younger? Is that a possibility? Because he does seem kind of obsessive about her and being with her all the time. He sure does. But I don't know if he'd be suspicious of her. I mean, we haven't had any inkling of any affairs or anything, right? No, I'm just thinking maybe he's thinking if she gets out there and has a job and meets new people, she won't want me anymore. Because he's used to her being so dependent on him and being her rescuer. So it's really kind of a codependent relationship. Yes, it is. Yes. But it could be just that he wanted to be with her. It could be. But instead of his kids, that doesn't seem right. He seemed to choose her above his children. Well, Susan herself had a really strange reason for wanting to move out of Berkeley. She believed that she was being followed by Satanists who were angry about her campaign years earlier against them. And as usual, Felix supported her idea. She and Felix didn't feel like they fit in with the other parents in Piedmont, and I'm sure they didn't. I'm sure they didn't either. Susan believed that they weren't open to new people. The Piedmont people weren't open to new people. Although it does seem like Susan and Felix maybe weren't very open to new people either. But when her sons were moved into the B soccer league, she believed it was because the family wasn't accepted as part of the community. But, you know, some parents were really concerned that the Polk boys were very aggressive. So we are starting to see some problems with these boys as well. Yeah, but that's not a surprise. Well, no. You know, the neighborhood kids loved to go to the Polk house. It was a fun place. They had lots of pets. And groups of children were welcome to just run kind of wild around the property. But understandably, some of the parents didn't want their children to play there. There was just something off about Susan. She often behaved like one of the kids. She once took a group of boys to have their ears pierced without even consulting their parents. And that did not go over well. Oh, I bet it didn't. She wasn't much of a disciplinarian. In fact, actually, she was a real pushover. Her boys made demands on her, and she jumped up to please them. She did consult a therapist, trying to help herself become more assertive. But when she did speak up to her sons, they ignored her. 
But she and Felix had raised them to question authority and do their own thing, which they did. For example, if they hadn't been invited to a party or a bar mitzvah, they would dress up and crash the events anyway. They would, and Susan was really proud of that. <laughs> so I can imagine some of these other families weren't really happy about it. Yeah, no kidding. In 1997, Felix threw a surprise 40th birthday party for Susan, and he gave a long, loving speech in front of the guests, who all seemed pretty impressed with the love that these two were showing each other. But for Susan, doubts about her marriage were starting to pop up. She felt guilt for marrying an already married man, and she wondered what she was doing with someone who was her father's age. She began to see Felix as a real prude, and she acted out like a rebellious teen. So now we've reached a different level of dysfunction, maybe yeah, a little bit like. stronger one. Yes. Yeah. With her new, less flattering way of looking at her husband, Susan became angry about his expectations that she'd cook and take care of the boys. Which is something she used to love to do. Yeah, that was her thing. Yeah, yeah, My absolutely. My children, cooking, reading. Waiting on them hand and foot, spending yeah. all her time with them. But she is like a teenager. Yeah. She never went through adolescence as a normal person. You know, my armchair psychiatrist view on this is she never had her own adolescence, and now she's having it. And, of course, Felix is like the father figure in this. Yes. And then she started having suspicions that Felix was sleeping with his colleague, Sheila Burns. Although Sheila would deny that. Susan also began thinking Felix wasn't a caring and compassionate person. She decided he was cold, and she began to consider what life might be like if she got a divorce and went out on her own. They had these rental properties bringing in large amounts of money, so money wasn't an issue. And she knew that she could live comfortably apart from him. She could leave, and she could support her children all on her own, and that sounded like, you know, a really good thing to her. Yeah, then Felix became involved in the... Uh psychological fad of recovered memories. The idea was that adult problems often stem from forgotten childhood abuse. And Felix discovered that he had a gift for bringing out abuse stories in his clients. His colleagues were impressed with his success in this field, although there were some skeptics. Oh, this was such a big thing in the late 90s, remember? Uh -huh. Remember your inner child? Yep. That was a big thing with lectures and books. People made a lot of money off this. They did. It's just kind of nuts. Well, I don't know if nuts is the right word, but yeah, a lot of it seemed made up at least. Uh-huh. And Felix, he just seemed to completely ignore how easy it was for him to create false memories in the minds of his clients. And he had to know he was creating them. But, you know, believe the victim was the catchphrase for this type of therapy, so you weren't supposed to question it. With Felix, several women and a few men uncovered memories of being molested by their fathers or by their uncles. And some of these memories even crossed into the satanic worship that Felix had been so focused on years earlier. So over several years, Felix really built up a reputation as a therapist who could help troubled women discover repressed memories of child sexual abuse. Now, is that really doing anything to help them? Probably not. I mean, there were probably some who actually did have some child sexual abuse, but for the most part, kind of causing more paranoia and problems again, like he did with the satanic stuff. Now, you might not be surprised to learn that Susan also began to express discovering her own repressed memories. And this was, you know, where she really was going over the edge. In 1998, during a family trip to Disneyland, Susan had a psychotic break. After dinner one evening, she began to cry, and just seemingly out of nowhere. The, the boys were 15, 13, and 11 years old. Neither Felix nor the, her sons could console her. And Susan told Felix that night that she had repressed memories taking over her mind. She remembered hiding in a closet as a girl after watching her parents bludgeon a police officer to death with a hammer. And what's Felix do? He validated these memories, telling her that they were real. Yeah. Well, Susan went to her mom, and her mom tried to talk sense into her. She told her that she had never bludgeoned a policeman. 
and she also agreed to take a DNA test to prove to Susan that she was her biological mother because Susan was questioning just about everything. There was never any evidence that Susan's repressed memories were real, but she certainly did hold to their validity. Even after the psychological community decided that the process of recovered memories was a fraud, Felix and Susan didn't change their mind. They were stubborn. Susan continued to recover more horrible memories. She said that her brother had violently beaten her and that her parents were murderers. All of her claims were denied by all family members, but she explained that away, and Felix offered her support, telling her that she had suffered horrible things as a child and he would always be her advocate. So it's just all part of his role as being her savior. Yeah, I'm still... This, this guy's a psychologist. He's a professional. And, and he, I guess he's too close to things to see what's going on. Yeah, although a lot of it seems like he did it on purpose for his own benefit. Sure. Because if he's keeping her on well, she's not going to leave him. So I think he plays a big role in her mental illness and not getting help. I mean, he really was fueling her paranoia. Yes, he was. So when he was in his teens, the oldest boy, Adam, began to see his mother as definitely a mentally ill individual. And when he tried to talk to his father about it, Felix just refused to accept that Susan had any serious issues. Continued to fuel the paranoia, but it did seem like the only way that he could keep her by his side, and that's how Adam interpreted it. Yeah, that he needed to align himself with his wife. Yeah, no matter what. That way she'll stay with him. Yes, I think so. So after 16 years of marriage, Felix was 65, Susan was 40, and she began to question him about their first sexual encounter, saying she couldn't recall it. In the recovered memory way of thinking, her lack of memories for this event meant that she had repressed memories about it. In this instance, Felix would be the bad guy. Yeah, maybe he was, because he did have sex with her when she was just a teenager. You bet. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he is responsible in some way. But now, Susan was beginning to believe that Felix had hypnotized her and raped her. She was convinced that she had been hypnotized to hide the truth from her. And she began to see flashbacks or images of this rape. So she asked Felix, how can I live with a man who's done this to me? So she was going round the bend. Starting to. And Felix told his friends that Susan was just going through a rough patch. But I think he could feel that his influence over her was fading, and that made him kind of desperate. He really loved her, but she was beginning to hate him. She believed that he had used his power as her therapist to victimize her and to hold her in a life of subservience to him. That's some good insight there. Yeah, I mean, maybe he didn't hypnotize her or rape her, but... It was statutory rape. It was? I believe it was. I believe it happened before she was 18. Yeah. Yeah. So Susan was beginning to fantasize about having her own room and sleeping alone in her own bed. She said she couldn't stand to sleep with Felix anymore. And any time they did have sex, she would be convinced that it was rape afterwards. So that's not a, a fun sex life. As the marriage deteriorated, she claimed that he was violent. And according to what Felix told a close friend, Susan would beg him to scratch her and choke her, and he refused. No one ever saw any marks on her, and the children never saw their father abuse their mother. So there's no evidence that he was physically abusive. Now, Susan's mental health continued to deteriorate, and her recovered memories now included that Felix was a spy in the CIA and also working as an Israeli spy. She remembered how Felix had wanted her to have a natural birth with Adam, even though he was breech. So the conclusion from that was that Felix had wanted her to die in childbirth. Yes, yeah, so she really needs help that she's not getting. Then she began to believe that Felix was trying to poison her. She provoked him at home, calling him a dirty Jew, and mocking him for having a small penis in front of their boys. He started calling her crazy, and that, of course, set her off. 
He told her that if they did divorce, she would never get custody of their boys because she was unfit. So as these fights escalated, Felix and Susan began to push each other around. Even though Felix was much bigger, he became afraid of Susan. At night, he began sleeping with his door barricaded against her. And Susan seemed to be in this continued state of paranoia. And of course, it affected their children. Her sons began to get into trouble at school, but she would never believe that they had broken their rules and she'd always take their side. When they failed a test or got into a fight at school, she would take them out for a special lunch and tell them they hadn't done anything wrong and that the others at school were just out to get them. Once when Gabriel was suspended from school, Susan confronted the principal and told him, fuck off. The Polk House became known for loud, yelling parties and craziness. In fact, when the next-door neighbors sold their house, they felt it necessary to disclose to the buyers that the Polks were a huge nuisance. So that's something. It certainly is. Good neighbors. <laughs> In the autumn of 2000, Felix moved his office out of the family home. He and Susan ended up in this huge argument, and Susan smashed their wedding china on the kitchen floor. Then Felix dragged Susan upstairs. Somehow Eli became involved. Yeah, that's the middle son. He punched his mother in the face. Then older brother Adam wanted to call the police, but Felix ran after him to stop him. Because he was thinking, you know, here's this expert on adolescent psychology and I'm unable to deal with my own family. Adam thought both his parents were crazy. He felt sorry for his mother, who was clearly not well, and he was disappointed in his father for trying to hide the incident and cover it up. So, I think Adam's right on the money. He she is. did need help and his father wasn't getting it for her. So then Susan began to complain of numbness in her feet and hands. And Felix thought these could be early symptoms of multiple sclerosis. But Susan's theory was that Felix was actually poisoning her. He began offering her wine in the evenings and coffee in the morning, which she said he didn't used to do. And when she drank that morning coffee, she felt really tired after. She did go to a doctor who saw no signs of MS, but Felix told several people that his wife did have MS. It doesn't seem that he actually believed Susan had MS, but maybe this was a way to cover up her mental illness. He could say, well, she has MS. But he still refused to acknowledge that she was delusional. The marriage became worse over time, and life was really difficult at this point for the entire Polk family. Yeah, and then Eli and Gabriel were both kicked out of the public school for fighting and getting into trouble family moved to the village of Orinda. Schools there rated near the top on state testing, and the parking lot was filled with students' luxury cars amidst the teachers' Toyotas and Hondas. You know, that's something, because I remember in high school, one of my teachers saying, I had driven a Mustang to school, and we weren't rich, but it was kind of a nice car. It was my mother's car. And there were wealthier kids there who owned Porsches and expensive cars. But my teacher, who I really respected and was a brilliant woman, owned this old Toyota and couldn't afford to live near the school. So it's just awful, I think, how our teachers are underpaid. Because these kids with the luxury cars, what are their parents doing for the money? I don't know. I'm just a socialist at heart, I guess. You'd have a tough argument there. It, it bothers me. But, you know, the residents were cultured and they were wealthy and they believed their neighborhood was the best for raising their families. And Felix and Susan believed that this new setting could make their lives better. Their home was gorgeous, like a mountain retreat, which cost them $1.8 million. So really a mansion. I guess, because this is still like 20 years ago or so. Yes. This house had an unusual setup where hours could pass without family members bumping into each other. Susan, Felix, and Gabriel lived in the main house, and Eli and Adam shared a pool house. Now, this pool house was a perfect setup for teenage boys who liked to get into trouble. 
Property was set apart in the neighborhood, sitting on a long, winding road, rarely traveled by anyone that wasn't in the family. Well, imagine some teen boys having a pool house to themselves. Of course, they would just go crazy and wild and have parties, well, especially these boys who leaned that way. These boys have a proclivity for that anyway. They certainly do. So the Polk House just became party central. For Eli and Adam and their friends, Gabriel was still kind of young. But Eli and Adam's friends came to drink and do drugs in this poolside cottage, and the police were often called for complaints of noise. So they got to know the boys well, especially Eli, who seemed to get in the most trouble. And they described him as a good kid who just kept making bad choices. His teachers knew him as a doper who would sleep through a lot of the lectures. So that's not good. <laughs> no. So Gabriel began spending less time at school and more time with his mother. He listened to her complaints, which included complaints about the school. Now both Eli and Gabriel were blowing off their classes, but they had her approval. The boys trusted Susan, and they began to believe that their father was the real problem in the family. Well, and I think over the years in this family, there was kind of a back and forth of Susan and Felix turning their sons against the other parent, which yeah. of course we know is not good for them, and Felix should have known that, even if Susan didn't. So Adam, the oldest, stopped spending time at home, and that was the only way he was really able to be successful. He was a social kid and well-liked. In 2000, he was the president of his class and a linebacker on the school's football team. So on school nights, he got home after dinner, like 7, 7.30, and studied until 11. And this way, he avoided a lot of that family drama. He did love his mom, but he described her as 80% sane and 20% delusional. That 20% was unpredictable, so it was impossible to predict or prepare for what she would do from one moment to the next. So Adam spent a lot of time with his dad which his younger brothers weren't doing. They were mostly spending time with their mother. Then in December of 2000, Eli was expelled from the entire school district for possession of marijuana. Susan somehow blamed Felix for this. Well, I think at this point she would blame pretty much everything on Felix. <laughs> Poor Felix. Yeah, well, he's kind of a jerk too, but... Then in January 2001, Susan and Felix had a big argument and Felix threw a pile of newspapers at her, and she called the police. But when an officer showed up, Susan complained to him, not only about Felix, but Eli also. She said that her husband and son both called her crazy. Well, she, duh. Yeah. <laughs> the policeman probably said, yeah, and? Well, but she denied she had a problem. Sure. But both Felix and Eli confirmed that Susan was emotionally unstable. Before the officer left, Susan told him that Eli was out of control and asked him to remove a large knife from his room. Yeah, so Eli's not doing so great. And the day after that, Susan was just very depressed and angry. She wrote in her diary that Felix was yelling at her and that he threw her clothing on the floor. He also smashed a chair and threatened to destroy all pictures of her. After she told him she wanted a divorce, he grabbed her, pushed her out the door, and told her he would get custody of their sons. So on January 17th, Susan went alone, taking a bus to Yosemite, a place where they used to hike when the boys were little, and she took a full bottle of aspirin and fell asleep. She did wake up with this awful ringing in her ears, and she called home, Eli answered, and she told him she loved him and she was sorry things hadn't worked out for the family. Then Felix got on the phone and spoke to her and figured out what was going on, and he called 911. So Susan was picked up by an ambulance and rushed to the hospital, put in intensive care. Felix took this opportunity of her hospitalization to get her some mental health help. But Eli thought that his father was using the tragedy just to get control back of the family. So after two days, Susan was discharged, even though Felix wanted her to stay longer. She refused to stay, and the doctors really didn't have a reason that they could hold her there. So Felix told people that Susan had had a nervous breakdown, and he began paying more attention to his sons and tried to do more things with them. 
He went to all of their games and showed them more love, but there was still a lot of anger and arguments between Felix and Susan. Many people wondered why Felix didn't leave the marriage, but it just seemed like he would never stop loving Susan and he would always want to be with her. Then that March, the couple had another big fight. Susan kicked Felix and he called the police. He claimed that Susan was a danger to herself and asked that she be held for 72-hour observation. Now, when asked questions, Susan wouldn't cooperate. She didn't respond. She asked for Felix to be taken to jail. And when they refused, she yelled at them to take her to jail, and she slapped Felix's face. So she was taken to jail, and she stayed overnight. And Felix got a one-week temporary restraining order, so she had to stay in a hotel. Then once the restraining order expired, Susan went back home. But Eli was there, and he said, get out of here, pushed her out of the door. So Susan called the police about this and then went to the house near the beach. Well, the boys did visit her there, and then the family went to see a court-appointed mediator. Eli said that his mother had a serious problem and that she was making up bad things about his father. Susan and Felix just couldn't agree on anything. The mediator concluded that Susan should get into a program of specialized treatment for past physical and sexual abuse issues. But then Susan filed for a domestic violence prevention order against Felix. And she wrote, This situation is urgent as there has been recent violence and bills are coming due soon. So I understand the part about violence, but what do bills coming due have to do with that? I'm not sure. It's a little disjointed. Well, and I think she was a little disjointed. And she did have an obsession about money and bills because she had grown up not always really well off. In May, Susan planned a trip to Paris with her middle son, Eli. She planned out their itinerary. She worked on her French. But it was a crummy trip. On the flight over, Susan got into an argument with the flight attendant. Then once in Paris, Eli slept a lot and had no interest at all in the art or history of the city. He hated Paris, was homesick, and wanted to go home. Susan blamed Felix for this. Eli called his father to get an early flight home, which he did, and then Susan returned home a few days later. Well, you know, it's just really hard on kids when their parents aren't working together and co-parenting. So it's a bad situation. She thought she'd take him there and they would bond and things would be better, which I understand. But then he calls his father, who gets him an early flight home, which it probably should have been something discussed between the parents. Probably. Susan was really writing a lot in her diary about her problems with Felix at this point. Back in April, she wrote, Felix acts like a Greek god who toys with the lives of us mere mortals. So she really saw him as so powerful that maybe she didn't think a divorce would even free her from him. Her mental stability continued to decline, and she began to hate things which she used to love, like caring for her kids and her dogs and She wanted to escape her life. When she told Felix her feelings about moving far away, he told her, well, you know, the same emotions are going to follow you wherever you go. Then in June, Susan traveled to Thailand with her 14-year-old son, Gabriel. This trip did not turn out as Susan imagined. She hated the accommodations, and she felt that the Thai people were duplicitous. She ended up calling the trip a debacle, so they left Thailand and traveled to Hawaii for the remainder of the trip. Then when she returned from Hawaii, Susan noticed that Felix had been working on his appearance, apparently in an effort to win her back. She laughed about it and she began identifying with Felix's first wife and regretted stealing her husband. Yes, so later that summer, Gabriel and Eli asked for a family meeting. They told Felix they wanted to live with their mother. Even if she was crazy, she was a good mom, and they loved her, they said. Adam said that it was time for that marriage to end. Felix was upset, but he did move out. He went to live in an apartment unit that they owned, and that allowed Susan to move back into the house with the boys. But Susan still had these thoughts of moving away, and she started thinking about moving to Montana for a fresh start. That September, she, Eli, Gabe, and their three dogs drove north to Montana, and they lived in a four-bedroom cabin surrounded by forest. 
She rented the cabin for three months for $2,000 a month, and she thought the move helped her feel better. The people in Montana felt really friendlier and less judgmental to her, and she thought the boys' new school was just great. But the good things didn't last. Things did fall apart pretty quickly. For one thing, Felix was lonely and wanted his family back. Eli and Gabe were in Montana with Susan, and Adam was now off at college at UCLA. Felix told Susan and his sons that he'd been diagnosed with prostate cancer, but he'd made it up just to get them back. He was really desperate to fix things. He did feel certain that Susan needed therapy and medication, and he was probably right about that, but she refused it. He was the problem, not her. If you compare the winter in Montana, it's probably colder than the winters in California. Yeah, Southern California. So life became less and less ideal for Susan in Montana. She caught Eli stealing money so he could buy marijuana. So she went out and bought a safe. Then she and Eli began to have frequent arguments. Not too long after that, Eli left to go to California to be with his father again. And after that, Susan and Gabe returned to California also. Susan called the landlord and said she had to drive home for a family emergency. But here's the thing. When the landlord went to the vacated cabin, he found a glass bookcase missing, a window pane destroyed, a broken chair, a missing interior door, and just some other things. It was a mess. It really looked as if someone had tried to kick his way out of the door and probably had destroyed it. But Susan tried to blame the damage on an intruder, The landlord didn't believe her. Would an intruder break open an inner door? And would an intruder take a big wood and glass bookcase? One of the chairs from the kitchen was found broken out in a barn, and Susan claimed that one of her sons had sat on the chair and it just broke on its own. But it looked to the landlord like the chair had been propped under a doorknob to keep someone in a room, and it had been broken. It was obvious that she had left in a hurry because she did leave several things behind. And while cleaning up, the landlord's wife found a short story beneath a mattress and another short story in a bureau drawer. She read these stories and was quite disturbed. The writing was really disgusting. The first one was about a wife and mother who waited for her husband to leave the house each day so that she could have sex with her son. From that, the mother gave birth to a child and raised it as hers and her husband's. Then the second story she found even more disturbing. This was about a wife who kills her husband in their kitchen with a kitchen knife one day when he comes home from work. And she thought maybe one of the boys had written it, but it turned out that these were Susan's short stories. And they would be brought up at trial. Well, I'm sure. In February of 2002, Eli got into a serious physical fight at a jack-in-the-box restaurant. Eli was 16, but he was big, and he was quite intimidating. He threw the first punch at an 18-year-old, breaking his nose and injuring his face. And he did this because he had a roll of quarters in his punching hand. He was charged with assault with a deadly weapon causing serious bodily injury. He pled guilty to a felony. He was put on house arrest with an ankle monitor and placed in the custody of his father. Uh, He moved into the apartment in Berkeley and enrolled in Berkeley High School. Well, Susan was really distraught, but it was her priority to separate from Felix. So she offered him the house, custody of the boys, and all of their investment properties. She also said she would leave and never contact her sons again until Felix was dead. But Felix ignored this offer. He and his attorney felt sure that she would change her mind, and she did. But Felix really wanted his family to be reunited, which was tough because his wife really seemed to despise him now. She sure does. He worried about his sons being with her, too, and he told a few friends that he was thinking of killing himself. Now, what his friends didn't know is that he did have a loaded revolver registered to Susan back in 1985, which he kept in his Berkeley office closet. But finally, he decided to file for custody of his sons. And using his credentials as a psychologist, he told the court that he was a clinical psychologist with a Ph.D. from Berkeley, and in his opinion, 
Susan was unstable and angry. He recommended that the court authorize an evaluation to figure out what was best for Eli and for Gabe. But, you know, Susan was becoming more and more unstable. She was doing some crazy shit. Yeah, one day she punched a neighbor during a squabble about her dogs running loose. Well, yeah, apparently one of her dogs had bitten a smaller dog that belonged to the neighbor. And then when the neighbor came by weeks later, she said, please keep your dogs away from mine. Yeah. Which was reasonable. But Susan just lost it. When she was alone with her youngest, Gabriel, she started talking about various ways to kill his father, including drowning him in the pool, drugging him, running him over, or sabotaging his car. And she would laugh about this. One day, she even told Gabriel that she was going to shove a shotgun into Felix's chest and order him to transfer money into her account. And poor little Gabriel, he told her, you know, that's a bad idea, Mom. Yeah, yeah I don't think you want to do that, Mom. That's just a lot for him to be living with. And on several occasions, Susan mistakenly referred to Felix as her father. Felix knew that Susan hated her father and believed she had been molested by him. So he, he's worried about what she's going to do to him. Well, yeah, if she's that delusional. Yeah. Eli had a court hearing after violating his detention order several times. At the hearing, Susan stormed out and ignored the judge. She was found in contempt of court in order to have psychological counseling. Eli was returned to his father's apartment. So he's still missing his brothers, his mother, and his dogs. Yeah, Eli was going through a lot. He was. So Susan put the big house up for sale, and during the summer of 2002, she convinced Eli to move back home. But remember, he's on house arrest in his father's custody. That's right. Can't do that. Well, he did. At her advice, he cut off his ankle bracelet and moved back into the pool house. And when deputies would come looking for him, he would hide, and Susan would support that. She actually thought it was pretty hilarious. Then when Eli was finally caught, which took months, he was put in a facility for young offenders, which was located out on a ranch. Susan ordered Felix to return to the family house to care for now 15-year-old Gabriel because she was going to move back to Montana all by herself. So she was going to buy this modest condo in the mountains, and Felix learned upon his return home that Gabriel had actually missed an entire semester of school if she kept him home. So he definitely wanted to get permanent custody, and he pleaded with the court, explaining that Susan was just completely self-absorbed and not a fit mother at this point, which was sad because she did used to be a really good mom. Felix was granted temporary custody of Gabriel and control of the house he and Susan owned. A judge reduced her alimony and child support payments, and Felix was surprised by the big reduction, and he offered to pay more. Susan blamed him for all this and refused his help. Eli, by this point, had totally turned against his father. Gabriel was figuring out that his father wasn't the monster his mother had made him out to be. And while Susan was away in Montana, Gabriel and his father were bonding. They had these daily routines, including dinner and TV shows they watched together each evening, and Felix began to feel hopeful that Gabriel could be saved. He thought he could at least have Adam and Gabriel in his life as he grew old. He had no interest in remarrying, and he was still in love with Susan and still held out hope for them. Susan did call Gabriel pretty often, and one evening on the phone, she told Gabriel and Felix that she was returning to California because she had some things she needed to pick up. She also had a dental appointment, so she told Felix he could live in the pool house while she and Gabriel lived in the big house. If he didn't do it, she said, she would blow his head off. Well, that makes an easy decision, doesn't it? <laughs> it doesn't have a lot Jeez. of options, yeah. On October 6th, which was a Sunday, Felix called a friend and told him that Susan had called from Montana and told him she would kill him. Felix considered calling the police, but he's embarrassed about how his life had ended up. His friend, who was an attorney, told Felix that he absolutely had to call the police. So he did. He called the town's police chief and calmly told him that his wife had threatened to kill him. Yeah, I think Felix always sounded so calm that 
the seriousness of these things was sometimes undervalued because he just sounded so damn calm. And the chief just told him that he could get a temporary restraining order, he could move, or he could hire a security guard. But they weren't going to send police over to watch out for him or do extra drive-bys. Well, no, because they don't have enough reason. Yeah, or probably enough staff. But I would think when you threaten to kill someone, isn't that against the law? Yeah. Yeah, so why wasn't she arrested for that? She'd done it more than once. I know they saw it as a domestic squabble or whatever, but this was pretty serious at this point. Well, yeah, but we don't know how serious. Well, we do because somebody ends up dead. We know because we're doing this <laughs> podcast, but right. the police... They don't Listen, know. They don't know. No, and he really did need to get some kind of restraining order more than those temporary ones, which he didn't do because right. he was holding out hope. He still was. Yeah. So Susan arrived home October 9th, 2002, and Felix was immediately relieved to see that she wasn't carrying a gun. Susan was upset because Gabriel seemed to be enjoying himself with his father. So she felt he must think she was delusional like Felix did. Yeah, Felix had a lot of trouble talking with her. She was just wired up and told him to leave immediately. He had a court order giving him control over that house, but she just didn't even care. And she whispered, I'm going to kill you, into Felix's ear, and Gabe overheard this. Felix went to call the police, while Gabe blocked his mother in the kitchen trying to protect his father. So Felix called 911 that night at 11.19 p.m. He told the dispatcher that his wife was kicking him out of the house and that he wasn't going to leave because he had a court order and he had custody. Finally, a decision was reached that Susan would spend the night in the house while Gabe and Felix went and stayed at a hotel. Just for their own safety, really. The next day, Susan moved Felix's furniture out to the pool house and she changed all the locks on the house. Then she called the realtor in Montana and backed out of buying the condo, so she was going to stay now. Going to stay there. So Felix drove with Gabriel and Adam to drop Adam back at his fraternity in Los Angeles. On the trip, Felix seemed really depressed. He talked with his boys about Susan's threats to kill him. Once they got to Los Angeles, they ate lunch, watched a football game. And then Gabriel and Felix arrived home about 9 o'clock in the evening. So for some unknown reason, Felix made the tragic decision to sleep in the pool house instead of returning to the hotel. Now he and Gabriel had plans the next day to see a baseball game in San Francisco. So what exactly happened that night, Sunday, October 13th, 2002, has been debated. But we do know that Susan went to the pool house that night and had a final confrontation with Felix. On Monday night, he was found face up on the terracotta floor. He had 27 wounds on his body, including 15 stab wounds and evidence of blunt force trauma as well. So it was almost 8 p.m. that Monday, October 14th, when Gabriel's concern about his father made him act. All that day he'd been worried he hadn't heard from his father, and he knew his mother was making jokes and laughing about killing Felix. So as Gabriel finally got the nerve to go out and climb the steps to the pool house, he was hesitant to go in, afraid of what he might find, because he had an idea that maybe his mom had killed his dad. But the door he tried to open, the one that they always used, was locked, and he didn't bother to check the other doors. I think he was just afraid. He ran back to the main house, went back upstairs to his room, where he just stayed for about an hour trying to figure out what he should do. He was thinking he would need to call the police if his dad didn't turn up soon. Oh, absolutely. So at 9 p.m., Gabriel dialed 911, and he just asked to get the number of the Orinda Police Department's non-emergency line. He didn't want to overreact and look stupid. So he was trying to locate the officer who had come to the house several days earlier for the domestic disputes and ask if he had heard anything from his father. 
So he grabbed a flashlight and went back downstairs with the phone number for the Arinda Police Department in his shorts pocket. And on his way out the door, his mother stopped him. Why did you call the police, she asked. Sounds kind of like a horror movie. It does. He said, I didn't call the police, and he continued walking outside. He went to the carport where his mom kept the car. So the poor kid, he wanted to check his mother's Volvo for any traces of his father. He had this grisly thought that maybe his mother had used the car to run him over or to transport his dad's dead body somewhere. But the car looked fine, and his mother yelled out to him, What are you doing? So she was there watching him from the house. He told her he wasn't doing anything. He walked down the steps back to the pool house to hide from his mother. And with the main door locked, he went to another door that faced the house. And he entered through the kitchen and walked down a narrow hallway to the balcony area, which overlooked the living room. Shining his flashlight into that dark area, he saw his father lying on the ground, covered in blood. Yes, this was way too much for him to see his father that way. He quickly left the cottage and shut the door behind him, feeling frantic as he returned to the main house. Without saying anything to his mother, he grabbed the cordless phone and ran back outside. He ran up the path that led to a hidden area of the property where the family kept the trash cans. He could hear his mother calling him as he crouched behind the wooden carport and dialed 911. Just a few minutes, seven minutes, had passed since he first called 911. He recognized the same dispatcher's voice when she answered. Murder, he said. And there's a short pause, and the dispatcher asked, Where at? Gabriel gave the address. Then Susan showed up at the pool house and asked, Did you see that? <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Gabriel just wanted to get as far away from her as possible. Oh, my God, the poor boy. So he ran barefoot down the hill and into the road and flagged down an arriving fire truck. And he stayed with the firemen until the police units arrived just after 10.15. Well, this scene was just brutal. There were low-velocity blood spatters all over the room and medium-velocity spatters from Susan hitting him and stabbing him while he was already bleeding. With chemical enhancement, investigators found a full shoe print, but they couldn't match it to any shoes in the house. It was after 1 a.m. on the morning of Tuesday, October 15th, when Sheriff's Officers Jeff Mule and Jeffrey Hebel finally sat down with Gabriel in a small interview room. They'd left him alone in the tiny room for nearly 30 minutes, watching and recording him on the hidden video camera. Susan was taken to a separate interrogation room, where she asked, What happened to my husband? Is he dead? And she denied being involved. When asked if she loved her husband, she said, Well, I'm fond of him. And I'm not angry enough to have killed him. <laughs> Great. But two uniformed police officers knocked on the door of Adams' fraternity house in Los Angeles, and he was told that his father had been murdered and his mother was the prime suspect. And, of course, that didn't surprise him. He got a call from his brother Gabriel, and this conversation was recorded because Gabriel's at the police station. And Gabriel said, Mom fucking shot Dad with a shotgun. What the hell is wrong with her? I hope they give her the death penalty. And so Gabriel's worried that his mother would be set free. A counselor, a crisis counselor, came in to talk with Gabriel, gave him some socks and sweats to sleep in. Sheriff's deputies went to the detention center to tell Eli what had happened. Eli's crying. I mean, he said his mother couldn't have done it. She's a gentle person. He suggested that maybe an angry patient of his father's was responsible. He admitted that his parents' divorce was stressful, but he would never do anything to get his mother put in jail. Well, Gabriel was sure that his mother was responsible. He claimed his mother had been talking about murdering his father for weeks. Most recently, when he was eavesdropping on the October 7th phone conversation, between his parents during his mother's return trip from Montana. When she was coming back from Montana, she actually called my dad and told him what she was going to do. She threatened to shoot him with a shotgun, Gabriel said. So Gabriel believes his father's been shot, which makes sense because she had threatened that. That's what she said. 
and there's blood all over the place. So. So how do you know? So Gabriel's outraged. His mother's vengeful action had stolen his father from him forever. He refused to take her calls and refused to visit her in jail. And any letters she wrote, he destroyed. He and Eli were close, but they had opposite reactions to their father's death. Eli was heartbroken that his dad was dead, but he still loved his mother and missed her terribly. He was in detention. He couldn't get out to visit her. Well, when Susan finally went to trial, prosecutors wanted a conviction of murder in the first degree. They claimed that Susan planned the murder of her husband for money. Susan first denied any knowledge of or involvement in her husband's death. Then she changed her story and claimed self-defense. After years of beating and sexually abusing her, she said, Felix had come at her with a kitchen knife, and she had got control of the knife and stabbed him instead. The defense was able to get an expert witness, a forensic pathologist, who testified that Felix's death was caused by heart disease and that the stab wounds really weren't life-threatening. And this pathologist failed to appear in court the following day to continue being cross-examined and to present documents that he claimed to have received from Susan. So he sent a written explanation to the judge, and he returned with the letters a week later to resume his testimony. Prosecuting attorneys dismissed Susan's self-defense claim, though, arguing that she had no defensive wounds from her husband's alleged attack on her, and that he had been killed from the knife wounds. Now, this trial ended in a mistrial, when the wife of Susan's attorney, named Daniel Horowitz, was murdered in a totally unrelated incident. So then Susan fired her attorneys and decided to represent herself. Always a good decision. Yeah, which is, you know, even more horrible because she's going to make her sons testify with her doing the cross-examinations. She built her defense with allegations of a history of marital and professional misconduct by her husband, and this included claims that Dr. Polk had drugged and raped her when she was a teen, brainwashed the couple's children, and threatened to kill her if she ever tried to leave him. She also claimed to be a psychic with advanced knowledge of the September 11th attacks that could have been used to prevent those attacks if her husband had prevented her from alerting the authorities. Then she added that her husband was an Israeli spy. So I'm imagining she's looking unstable to be saying that stuff. I can only imagine. She repeatedly requested a second mistrial. She made accusations of conspiracy against the prosecutor and the judge. Requests were continually denied. Then during her closing statement, Susan, who had refused to pursue a line of defense based on her own mental illness, questioned whether public perception that she was delusional was hurting her case. Huh. You think? Well, I mean, if it is, it's her own issue. So each of Susan and Felix's children testified at the trial. Gabriel testified that his mother had talked about ways of killing her husband in the weeks before Felix's death. The oldest son, Adam, also testified against his mother, getting a lot of media coverage when he referred to Susan on the stand as cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Yeah, that was something the papers just ate right up. Oh, sure. Good quote. Eli testified on his mother's behalf. He claimed that Felix was the unstable parent and was abusive to his mother. Yeah, but it seems like the jury believed the other boys, and they didn't believe Susan or Eli. She was found guilty of second-degree murder, and she was sentenced to prison for 16 years to life. All of her appeals have been denied. She was up for parole in 2019, but that was denied, and I believe the next time she'll be eligible for parole is 2029. Well, that's an unsettling story. Isn't it, though? Yes. (laughs) It really is. I mean... Just so much stuff going on, any one of which is probably not good for your mental health. But you know the thing is, stuff like this goes on in families all the time. We don't know what goes on behind closed doors. And mental illness is fairly common. And the thing is, we don't treat it like we do physical illness. So sometimes it's just allowed to get worse and worse. Yeah. Well, here it is. So our sources for this case... There are two books, Seduced by Madness, written by Carol Pogosh, 
and Final Analysis, The Untold Story of the Susan Polk Murder Case. And that one was written by Catherine Cryer and Cole Thompson. We also use the Mercury News archives to get a lot of information on this case. TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. If you enjoy listening to our shows, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen. If you visit our website, tigerever.com, you can find a shopping page where you can buy some brewery merch as well. We have teas, tanks for the warmer weather, and now that it's cooling off, People are really enjoying our soft hoodies and, with this horrible pandemic, our masks. You can subscribe to our members-only show, True Crime Brewery Premium, on our website. And as a member, you get a new bonus episode each and every month. You get ad-free versions of our weekly shows, plus access to about 50 of the bonus episodes that are out so far. Also, we'll send you a gift and a handwritten thank you note. And once you're a member, you don't have to listen to these self-promotions anymore, so that's a bonus. So our first email is a case suggestion from Deborah. It's been a few months since my last suggested case, but this totally slipped my mind. I was working at the jail the night she was brought in. I tried to send a link, but here are their names. William Billy Boyette and Mary Rice. Reddit has more detailed info. Peace, love, and many blessings, Deborah. So this is just a quick capsulation of this case. We'll look into it. Billy Boyette and his girlfriend Mary Rice killed four women over a short time in 2017. Alabama and Florida, somewhere down there. They got tracked to a hotel in Georgia. In this big police standoff, Billy killed himself. Mary surrendered, and then she was found guilty of all the charges. So she's in prison. Okay, so Bonnie and Clyde type of deal. Bonnie and Clyde. All right, and then we have a case suggestion from Janine. Hi, Dick and Jill. I love your podcast. I live in Australia and have a crime suggestion for you from Australia's far north Queensland. Julianne Leahy and Vicki Arnold, best friends, were found dead in a four-wheel drive vehicle on a remote track at Cherry Tree Creek on the Atherton Tableland west of Carnes, a spot the two had never been to before. Two weeks earlier, Julianne's husband had reported to police that the two had failed to return from a late-night fishing trip. Two inquests had failed to satisfy the families of the victims. The police investigation was botched from the very beginning, claiming it was a murder-suicide. Julianne was a -a pack-a-day smoker, but she didn't take her cigarettes. Vicky wore glasses, and she didn't take those with her. The police claim that Vicky shot her Fred with a sawed-off rifle, bludgeoned her with a rock, and slit her throat. She then turned the gun on herself and shot herself in the chin and the back of her head, which seems almost impossible. Mr. Leahy shortly thereafter began an affair with his wife's 16-year-old half-sister, whom he had been grooming for some time. I am keen to hear your take on this mystery. I also have a beer suggestion from Great Barrier Reef Brewing Company. Hazy Days Unfiltered Lager, Double Shot Coffee Amber Ale, and Two Turtles Pale Ale. Cheers, Janine. So, Janine, thank you. You have some really good crimes in Australia. Interesting stuff. Maybe I shouldn't say good. But this was an interesting one because it certainly sounds like it was a double homicide and not a murder-suicide. But they've been through two inquests. I don't know what their options are now. Well, no, I think we should read the inquest and see Yeah, we'll look and see. what's going on with that. But it does. And then this whole thing about one woman's husband taking up with his wife's 16-year-old half-sister. And, wow. Yeah, that makes him look kind of suspicious, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're going to save voicemails for next week because we're getting to a really long podcast here, touching almost two hours. So I think we should wrap things up for today. Okay, it's a wrap. Okay, so thank you everyone for listening, and we will see you next time at the quiet end. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye now.